I want to share with you a word I've been thinking about. What do, you, what do you say? My message is called Supernatural Hero. Supernatural Hero. That's a, a, a sort of a, a bit of a play on common words that we hear these days. But if I asked you right now, could you think of a Bible hero? If you, could you think of a, a superhero in the Bible? Somebody that you would say, uh, that's, a, that's a great superhero. Who would you think of? Joshua. Joshua. David. You see, there's so many people in the Bible, isn't it? The Old Testament, the New Testament, men and women have done great and amazing things. Uh, maybe you at some point in your life, maybe you thought to yourself, I, I wish I was a little bit more like David, or I, I wish I was a little bit more like Joshua, I wish I was a little bit more like one of these guys. Maybe I, I wish I was like Peter who walked on the water, or, or David who, who slayed Goliath, or, or maybe Moses who, who walked uh, and led the people out of, out of, the, out, out of uh, captivity. Maybe a little bit like Joshua, maybe a little bit like Daniel who stood in the midst of great oppression, maybe a little bit like Esther, who who trusted God in the midst of of the most difficult of times, just for such a time as this. Maybe a little bit more like like Paul, maybe a little bit more like Mary. I think all of us at some point must have looked and found a superhero in the Bible and said, I wish I was a little bit more like that. Now, you know, to the Jews, to the Jews, there's one superhero that stands out. There's one superhero that by far is recognized as the greatest superhero in the Bible, and that's Elijah. Elijah is is recognized as uh, one of the greatest Jews of the Old Testament. In fact, he is mentioned more than any other Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. And the one big reason for that was he raised the dead. He, he raised the dead, and, and that's a phenomenal thing. James 5, uh, and this is sort of going to be my, my, my set-up scripture for today, but, but in James 5, we, we see James saying that, that Elijah was a man just like us. He was no different to us. He, 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 he was a man like us. And, and I think if you, if you read that and you hear that scripture and, and you see that, you say, but, but that's impossible. Elijah, I'm not anywhere in the same league as Elijah. There's, there's no way that I am like him. Uh, even Abraham, how can I be like Abraham? Or how can I be like Paul? Or how can I be like Peter? This is just not, this is just not, this is just not right. And yet... None of the Bible heroes are better than us. None of the Bible heroes, none of those great men and women that you read of in Scripture are better than us. And sure, we can can identify with Job's depression, and we can identify with David's weakness. We can identify with Peter's foot in his mouth. We can identify with Jonah's running away from God. We can identify with Thomas's doubt. And we can identify with Moses' excuses. But their hero? That's the hard part. We, We can identify with their weaknesses and their failings. But can we identify with the things that they did in the name of the Lord? And that's what I want to touch on today. Every one of us is a man like Elijah. The greatest difference is that we live under better promises. We live in a new covenant. We live under a new dispensation. New Testament believers are supernatural heroes. Yeah. No, no amens to that one? We are supernatural heroes because we have the spirit of the living God living within us. We have been set free. We have been empowered. James says to us in James 5 verse 16, he says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was a human just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three days and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. James makes a very big point here. James is saying that Elijah was no different to us. He prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed, and it just started raining. No different to us. He prayed for fire to fall from heaven, 
Not only once, but three times he prayed for the fire to fall from heaven, and three times the fire fell from heaven. He multiplied the food. He raised the dead. But he's a man just like us. That, that phrase, just like us, is actually found in Acts, the 14th chapter. In the 14th chapter, we find that uh, Paul and Barnabas just miraculously healed a man, a crippled man. He was crippled, and, and everybody knew he was a cripple, and it was quite widely known. And, and they healed this crippled man, and the people around were so amazed at this mighty thing that had happened that immediately they started coming around Paul and around Barnabas, and they said, you guys, you guys must be gods. You, you guys must be sent of the gods. And they came, and they wanted to start worshiping them and making sacrifices. And Paul said, whoa, wait a minute. Don't do that. We're just humans, just like you. Well, they wanted to stone them after that, but it's the same phrase. We're just human, just like you. I think the thing that James and Paul really points out to here is they're trying to disarm this religious posture that people sometimes get, that there's only certain people who can function and can w work and can move in the things of God, that, that somehow th those are Bible stories. It has to be them, or that's the elders, or that's the pastors. They are the ones. But when we get this idea of, of superheroes, at the same time we get this concept that somehow they have something super special that I don't have. And because they are super special, that's why they can do what they can do. And so we start thinking to ourselves, I can't match up. I, I can't match up with, with Abraham. I can't match up with Paul. I, I can, cannot match, match up with Peter or Paul or any one of those. And we start diminishing ourselves and saying, well, that was just the superheroes of the Bible. Somehow they had a superhuman ability. I want to tell you today, God takes ordinary people and fills them with the Spirit to accomplish extraordinary things if they allow Him to. If they allow Him to. God takes ordinary people, fills them with His Spirit, and empowers them to do amazing things if they will walk in it. Here's the thing, though. Elijah did not have any level of faith that's unattainable for you and I. Elijah had nothing that you and I cannot walk in. You cannot say, yes, but that was Elijah. Well, here's a shocker for you. You cannot even say, yes, that was Jesus. Because Jesus says to us in John 14, he says this in, in, in verse 12. Is that up there? Yep. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Because the Father, uh, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's Jesus. Why do we limit ourselves when we're believers filled with the Spirit and, and walking in the things of God? We, we, we need to stop limiting ourselves to the things that God's called us to, the things that God's opened up for us. We need to stop putting believers in boxes of exclusion and say, oh, this uh, is out of reach for you, and that's out of reach for you, and you cannot operate because that was Elijah. We have the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that now lives within us. The same power that Jesus walked in and operated in and functioned in is available to you and I right now. And I wonder to myself sometimes, why do, why do we as Christians walk such a defeated life? Is it possible that we have not recognized that we are the superheroes in the New Testament story? When God calls most people, most people answer, out of flesh, out of fear, 
out of insecurity, out of failures, out of limitations, out of shortcomings. Most people, when God calls them, will come back and say, oh God, but, but I can't do this and I, I can't walk in that and I can't go there and I can't function in this way. I, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not, but it's not about you. It's not about who you are. It's about who he is in you. He has poured his spirit into you and filled you up with all of that so that you can walk in the power that's available to you. But if we were just, if we were just for a moment open to respond to the call of God in the way of the Spirit and respond, respond to God in the way that the Spirit calls us, I promise you, your answers will be different. Because we are mighty men and women of God. We have been called and positioned. We serve a mighty sovereign God who empowers us with all power that heaven has. You are a son of God, a daughter of God. You are empowered. It's God's grace that holds you and it's his love that preserves you. Amen. See, we've got to believe that. We've got to believe that. Now, what kind of faith do you have? And I think this is real. God's really challenging us as believers to walk in the fullness of our inheritance of who we are in Christ. What kind of faith do you have? Because if this is true, if this scripture is true, then Elijah has nothing on us. Elijah is no better than us. He's no better or worse than us. No matter how great somebody's ministry is, it should not intimidate you. Because they have nothing on you. You're a child of God. You know what? I believe with all of my heart that I can raise the dead. I believe with all of my heart, if I had to pray right now, if I was surrounded by 300 people who wanted to, because, because of my God, want to kill me like they did the prophets of Baal around Elijah, and I prayed for God to bring, for I believe with all of my heart that he would do it. What kind of faith do you have? What do you believe? Here's something about God. When he speaks to you, the before has already happened. When God speaks to you, the before has already happened. Look at this in Jeremiah 1, verse 4 to 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Ephesians 2, verse 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good work, works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you, do you see that? Do you get what that means? That God has prepare, prepared beforehand what you should walk in. God has determined what your life and what your purpose is long before you even came here. You were designed for God's purposes. Now, you may not jump up and down and say yay about that, but I want to tell you, according to Scripture, before you were born, before you even conceived, before your father and mother even had an idea that they were going to have you, God thought about you, He thought about your home, He thought about your city, He thought about your life, He thought about your purpose, and He said, I need another one, I need one, I need one for this purpose. I didn't come to Hobart because God didn't have any way to send me. God knew before I was born that he needed somebody to do what I'm doing. And God knows before you were born, and you were born, and you were born what you were meant to do. And he designed you, and he made you for that purpose. You've got to believe that. There's intentionality in God. Amen. The scripture tells us that God thought about you before you existed. You're not an accident. Nothing about me is an accident. Nothing about you is an accident. There's absolutely nothing about us that God just thought for a moment, oh my, what do I do now, and put you together. There's intention and purpose in everything. God was not waiting for the day you were born and then thought, oh, Nicole, what am I going to do with Nicole? Oh, John, what am I going to do with John? I, I better find something for him to do. Scripture tells us that before you were thought of, before you were even in existence, God knew exactly who you were and what you were meant for. And he designed you for a specific life and a specific purpose in a specific time. Amen. None of us are accidents. 
And too many people in the world today believe that they're an accident, believe that somehow they just fell apart and been put together and, and somehow it just happened. You are intentionally made for a purpose. And it's time that the believers, the children of God, start living with purpose because God's called us and made us and established us for purpose. One person thought that was good. Here's the other thing. God didn't just make you. He made you to be and do what nobody else can be and do. He didn't make copies. He didn't go and say, I made a mold. Now I'll stick everybody in the mold and I'll just run them off like a photostat machine. His purpose. You see, the reason I think this is so important is that Many of us, when God calls us, somehow we think that we have a replacement. We don't. We're one of a kind. And it's so interesting, though, that we come to God with all these reasons why, all these reasons why we cannot step into our purpose and our destiny. We come to God with all of these things that we think about, oh, well, this, this and that and the other. And, and you know what God does? God laughs at our excuses. And he can laugh at our excuses because he made us. And he knows that your excuses won't work because he designed you for the purpose that you now say you cannot function in. He designed you for the thing that he called you to. He designed you on purpose for a purpose. When we say it's too hard, it's not too hard. He made you for that. When you say, no, this is impossible, it's not impossible. It might be impossible for somebody else, but to you, you were designed for that. Jeremiah said, I'm just a child. Moses said, I I, I stutter. Gideon said, you don't know my family. My family is the worst. Jonah says, I can't do that. I hate those people. Jesus' disciples said, we've got too many other commitments. Many people today say, but I don't have a title. I don't have a badge. I, I don't have a certificate. God says, those things are fine, but I didn't make you for that. I made you for this. This is what I called you to. This is what I set you to. This is what your life is made for. And you know what? If we can just get a concept of that. But you know what happens when God calls people? The minute God calls us, so many of us, we start thinking of the reasons why. What is wrong with us? God says, I called you to pastor a a community somewhere. And you say, oh, I can't do that. I, I'm, not, I'm not the right person. And you start thinking about everything that is wrong with you. I'm not big enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not clever enough. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I, I, I just, I, and we think of everything that is wrong. What struck me this week is that's an insult. It's an insult to God because he called you to it. It's not humility. It's calling God a liar. Because you're saying the manufacturer has made a mistake in the product that he has set to the task. It's saying, God, you have designed me and made me, but I'm a mistake. You you made me this way, Lord, and, and you made a mistake by making me faulty. And I said, Lord, help me, Lord, to say yes. Because I'm not a mistake. And you're not a mistake. I'm not a fault. And you're not a fault. He designed you for a purpose. Before you were even conceived. What does that mean to you today? What do you believe about yourself? See, for too long we've allowed the lies of insecurity, the lies of mistake, the lies of not good enough to undermine what the manufacturer has designed us for. But I believe, like we heard the prophetic word this morning, the scenes are not changing. Something is happening in our city, in our state, 
And if you will just today say, God, done with excuses, what do you need me for? And you see, that's the thing, though. When Jeremiah came to God with his excuses, God said, it's not you, Jeremiah. I'm doing it through you. When Moses came, God says, stop it, Moses. I've got something. Every excuse that was ever brought in Scripture, God said, I made you. I know how to use you. 